This is more of what we call the pictorial. Uh, about not Saturday, but the Saturday before that, on uh, my TMM channel, I started uh, I started lecturing on this particular diagram, but because I was moving that weekend and I didn't have the computer set up, and right in the middle of my class, somehow I guess when I set it up, Google was set up for one hour, and it just when one hour was up, it just disconnected me altogether from the um, uh, the meeting and kicked, kicked me out and everybody else out at the same time, which I normally do about an hour anyways. But I wanted to go over a few more important things that I, I didn't get a chance to cover in that class. <clears throat> so if you could see this diagram, it's pretty rough to follow everything around. This happens to be... A refrigerator it's made by Whirlpool but it's got a Kenmore model number on it and um, can anybody tell me by looking at this refrigerator if it's a French door top freezer side by side what type of refrigeration unit is it it's a French door. well French what does French door mean French doors like that one right over there. It has a freezer on the bottom and two doors on the top. The French door bottom up. Anybody else agree, disagree, have any other uh, opinions? I'm going to have to agree. French door bottom up. Okay, what what made you think that that's a French door bottom up? The LED array. The LED array, which I is the I was going to say <laughs> the same thing. Top well, left, top right, middle left, middle look, right. Look at this picture right here. I'm going to go ahead and expand it so you guys can see it better. It's a little bit more blurry when I expand it, but if you look at that, that's the actual refrigerator. The freezer section's on the left and the refrigerator section's on the right. It's a side-by-side -side refrigerator. That Are we looking at the same thing? <clears throat> I don't see that. Oh, you're, you're looking at the schematic. That's the second page. This one here. You're looking at this page. Yeah. Oh. This is the pictorial version of it that I had up here on the screen. Oh, okay. So I didn't realize you were looking at the paper and not looking at this. Um, so this is a side-by-side -side refrigerator. The freezer's on the left. And <clears throat> what they're showing here is what components are inside the freezer section, what components are inside the refrigerator section. I know as I expand them, it's a little hard to read, so I'll have to uh, make it smaller again just so that you can read the font. I still can't read it, huh? Let's just do this. Leave. That wasn't good. Let's go back to it. I go to the PDF version of it. We can probably see it better there. So this is it here. Let me zoom out just a little bit. So. Here are the two sections, and I'll have to go back and forth because the other one I want to draw on. So freezer section, refrigerator section, it has the LED light on the right and left side. Notice how these lights are wired in series with each other. Um, I don't know why Whirlpool thought that that was a good idea, but this is just like the Christmas lights, those little tiny Christmas lights that you put on your trees or hang outside the house. And one bulb goes bad and the whole string stops working. Uh, that's how they decided to wire it. Yes, sir. Oh, it doesn't use a pull-down resistor to jump across in case that happens? No, it doesn't. One light goes out, all the lights stop working. Or if one light starts flickering, all the lights in the refrigerator start flickering on and off, and you don't know which one caused it. Like I told you. And most of the time, we have to replace all of them just to find out which one is the one that's the problem. Yeah. So if you look here... I'll follow this light here, it goes through this light, goes through this light, and it comes down and then goes through the light in the middle, and then it comes down, and then if you can look at all the lights here on the refrigerator side, they're all in series with each other. Now this is a separate game from that one. Oh, I didn't want to zoom out of that. Um, let's go back. This one here is a separate gang of lights from here, but if one of those lights fail, then all of the lights stop working. So it's a little bit hard to, to diagnose. So this is all lighting. This is an evaporator fan 
in the refrigerator section. What does that mean if it's got an evaporator fan in the refrigerator section? It's what? It's got a three-way valve, but what does that mean? A dual evaporator. So most refrigerators, let's start with the most simple basic refrigerator, and let me go into, I want to compare them from the simple refrigerators to more complicated ones. Most refrigerators, um, let's say a top and bottom refrigerator, where the freezer's on the top and the refrigerator's on the bottom, you have an evaporator here and a fan, and it circulates the air around in the freezer to cool the freezer, and it has an opening here we call a baffle, and some of that cold air goes into the refrigerator section from the freezer to cool the fridge. That's how most refrigerators were designed. Yes? Okay, if that's the condition with most refrigerators, then how is it possible to adjust them independently? I'll get to that in just a minute. I'll answer your question. So there will be somewhere in here a return air. So if we don't have the return air, we got to have a place for air to come in and a place to return. Let me get to the side-by-side, -side, then I'll answer your question. So most side-by-sides, freezers usually smaller than a fridge, the evaporator's here, the baffle's way up here, which controls the airflow into the refrigerator section, and then return. So the question is, how do we control the temperatures independently? And how do we make them achieve those temperatures? Okay, because in a freezer, we want about zero to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And a refrigerator is like 34 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? The, um, like how do we control the temperatures in, in a basic refrigerator? Basic. Yeah. Uh, either one. Okay. And we're talking about refrigerators from the 70s and 80s. Okay. okay. A basic refrigerator had a defrost timer, had a little timer motor, went from line one to neutral, and this was the timer. And it had a switch here which had two positions. One position was for a thermostat and then a heater, and then the other position was for your compressor and your fan motors. Okay, just like that. And you're, and you're like, okay, but we need a way to control temperature. So we started off with a thermostat right here. So we'll add a thermostat, and I'll put an arrow through an angle, meaning that that thermostat's adjustable. Okay, well, thermostat controls temperature, but we got a problem. We have two different temperatures we have to control, and we only have one thermostat inside the fridge. The defrost thermostat here has no control over the cooling of the fridge. So we want zero degrees up here, but we want 30 to 40, 34 to 40 in the refrigerator section. So the baffle here controls how fast the air from the freezer goes down into the refrigerator section. The baffle is like a window. You know, like when it's 40 degrees outside, you might open up your window or your house a little bit, not turn your air on to cool the house down. If it's too cold, what do you do? You close the window down or you open it up. So when we first started, we had a mechanical baffle. And that baffle will control the airflow from the freezer to the fridge. So this is what we do. If I turn the baffle, which is more to the closed position. In other words, I restrict how fast the air flows from the freezer. More air circulates up here. So the baffle, let's just say I make the opening very small. So the air is just trickling in. The thermostat that we use to control the temperature is in the refrigerator. So the contacts of this thermostat cycle everything off at 35 to 40 degrees. But if you want the freezer colder, you mechanically turn a damper, which slows down the air down here so we have more air circulating up here. So this is like, like, like I said, your house is, is not that cold, it's 40 degrees outside, you open up your window to let some of that air in. If it's too much, we close it down. Well, when we first designed that, the mechanical baffle only had one position. 
and the air from the freezer trickled into the fridge and came back, but most of that air stayed in the freezer, so we had freezer temperatures, okay? If we wanted it colder, we closed off the baffle more. There's no way to 100% close the baffle. When the baffle's at like the most closed position, it still has some airflow. We'll never completely block off the fridge. Now, if I wanted my freezer not so cold, let's just say, man, my ice cream is so hard as I stick my spoon in, the spoon's bending. I don't want my ice cream that hard. I want my temperature about 10 to 15 degrees in the freezer. So we open the baffle up, and by opening up the baffle up, the air comes in here a lot faster. That thermostat reaches the set point and shuts the whole refrigerator off. Fans, compressor, and everything. So there's no accurate way at this point to control this temperature. So now we go up to something where we, now we start to add computers in there. But before we get into computers, let's go to uh, an automatic damper. Oops. So these are what, bat what these baffles look like. These baffles, here, this one and this one, they're motorized baffles. So the computer can control them. But let's get, get rid of this control part here. And let's find a straight up baffle baffle here. Um, that's all motorized ones. I was trying to find one without a motor. Should you try on control? Um, Give me a second here. Obviously, I don't uh, don't find the one I'm looking for. This is close to it here. Um, well, let's just use this as an example. So. The original dampers that were created, they're just a piece of plastic. You turn it to one point, just like opening up the window of your house, and that's it. It don't move. So then they, they started using something similar to the thermostat in the refrigerator. Thermostat had a capillary tube filled with a gas or an oil. Once it reached a temperature, that fluid cycled a switch open and close. Well, they did the same thing with the damper. They, they had a damper, let's just say this is the damper, and they had a capillary tube here, and if it got too cold, the gas would mechanically push the damper closed, restricting the airflow into the refrigerator side. So you can adjust it warmer or colder, but the damper would move based on a fluid or a gas to control the airflow into the refrigerator section. Now, when they went into computers, like we have now, and now we used motorized dampers. And now the computer uses thermistors, one in the refrigerator, one in the freezer side. And the refrigerator said, give me more air, that damper would open up and let more air into the refrigerator side. When the refrigerator got closer to temperature, the damper started closing down and restricting the airflow into the refrigerator side. And then the freezer kept, kept its deal. And then when the thermostat in the freezer said the freezer was the right temperature, the computer would shut everything off. Then they even stepped it up a notch. Hmm, can, we, can, can we make it more accurate, the temperatures? Because whenever we use something for temperature control, AC, ovens, dryers, refrigerators, we cycled on and off on an average of temperatures. If I wanted 40 degrees, the temperature went down to 36 and shut off, and then it got warm because it was off, and then it went above 40, and about 42, 44 came on, and it cycled on and off in this range till we kept an average of 40 degrees. So what did the manufacturer do? Manufacturer started going to uh, electronic fan motors. This fan motor here is a variable speed fan motor. I talked about it that Saturday. I'll get into it in a little more detail. But when the temperature started getting close to set temperature, not only did the fan motors start to slow down and slowly turn, 
so did the compressors. The compressors were variable speed compressors. So when the refrigerator was warm, like someone had the refrigerator door open and they're loading groceries and they're cleaning it and everything, refrigerator comes on, the compressor and fans are max speed. But as we start getting closer to temperature, they slow down a little bit so that we don't way overshoot on or off. We're more closer to the set point. And the closer we are to the set point, the less temperature extremes we're putting our food to and our food lasts longer. So if we can maintain a temperature closer to what the customer wants, and as long as it's the right temperature for that food, like your, your vegetable drawers and, your, and so forth, they put these thermistors in there. Not just the fridge, now they have refrigerated drawers. They have drawers that have their own fan motors and they have their own thermistors and they control how cold each one of the drawers are depending on whether you got vegetables or, or uh, fruits in there or meats in there. Some of them keep the meat almost at freezing but not hard frozen so that the food you can take out of the freezer, put it in the fridge compartment and it would stay semi-frozen just right at the freezing point, not super hard like when you take it right out of the freezer. So when you want to cook it, it doesn't take that long to prepare. Where if you took a steak out of the freezer right away, you have to wait hours or throw it in the microwave on a defrost cycle before you can prepare and cook it. So with these electronics, we were able to more accurately control temperatures. And thermistors we've talked about before, they're the ones that sense the temperatures in the various areas and the control board is starting to control and communicate those. So I want to look at this schematic here. I did go over this fan motor in my Saturday's class. I'm just going to repeat it and, and go over the components now. If you look at the fan motor, it has ground, VCC, and PWN. Does anybody know what those letters stand for? Yes, sir. Ground is ground. Okay. VCC is usually referential voltage it uses. And then PWM is pulse width modu modulation, which is a uh, frequency signal, if I'm not mistaken, telling it what duty cycle to follow. Okay. So the blue one in the middle is how the board monitors the speed the fan is going, right? Which one? I'm sorry. The VCC. No. So is it the pulse width modulation that's doing that? I, so I'm not mistaken, there isn't direct uh, monitoring if it's not for cables. Okay, so instead of monitoring, which one of these two are controlling the speed of the fan? Is it the PWM or the VCC? Hold switch should be doing it, VCC feeding it. Explain that, because some of these guys don't understand what you're saying. So VCC will keep a constant refer uh, referential voltage there at all times, where the PWM will allow it to start the motor up and pick a speed. Okay, so if I was to troubleshoot this fan motor, mm -hmm. we know we got ground. We have three pins, one, two, and three. Which ones would I put my meter on to check to see if I'm getting voltage to that fan motor to get that fan motor to run? So you'd only, with a simple altimeter on DC, you could only check VCC. And then for pulse modulation, you need to go to frequency. Yes, so if we look on our schematic here, and I think it's here. Let me go to the evaporator oh. fan motor. Uh, trying to find the fan motor here. It's not there. Evaporator fan motor and so forth. So going into diagnostics here, we can check the fan motor. Now, let me ask you a question. If I went to the refrigerator and the compressor's running, should my evaporator fan motor be running? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no? You said if the compressor's running, it should be the evaporator fan running. I think. Always. Whenever the compressor is running, we should have the evaporator fan that, running, well, and what else? The condenser fan running. The condenser fan. So if you see one of them running, the other two fans should always be running. Electronic or not? Yes, sir. So I ran into a fridge that disconnects the fan the moment you open the freezer. Yes. 
how would I test for that live to ensure that both are actively moving if I have the unit somewhat disassembled? Tape the switch shut. Okay. Put your finger on it. Okay. Okay, but here they have a diagnostic that enables you to turn the fan on. One, that will bypass the door switch and allow the door switch, uh, allow it to run with the door open. Okay, so that means that the fan shutting down because the door switch is open is code in a computer, not a physical switch. And we'll talk about that in a second in schematic. Okay. That, good, that was a good observation. Um, so what happens here is by forcing the fan on, when you go into diagnostic, that usually forces the fan at maximum speed. So in other words, you're going to test the fan, and let's say the fan's running slowly. Bearings could be somewhat bad, even though it's getting full voltage, you don't know. So if you go into diagnostics and you force the fan to run, you're going to look for full voltage at the fan motor to see if that fan's working. So we don't have the voltage here, do we? So we have to go down here. And on this schematic here, oops, I went a little bit too far. On this part here, we have voltages that we're supposed to be testing. And if we look here at uh, power supply, which one of these was the fan motor? Uh, All thermistors. All of them. No, no, no. Well, the last three ones. The last three. Uh, but if you look, there's only really. There's three voltages there, 14 volts, there's a 5 volts, and there's a 7.5 and there's one pin. But other than that, almost everything is running off of 14 volts. All of your sensors are running off of 5 volts. So all the thermistors are getting 5 volts from the board, but your fan motors and other components that actually operate and do things are usually 14 volts. Yes, sir. This on this would be, yeah, on this. Why is it 14 over industry standard 12? It's just the way the manufacturer designed it. I couldn't tell you it's any better or any worse. Oh. Okay, it just, we have to go by whatever the manufacturer gives us. We don't go down to, you okay. know, the engineering level, which 12 volts usually is mm -hmm. the standard. And one thing that's neat is that we've taken 9 volt batteries and put them to fan motors and actually made the fan motors operate. If you knew which two of the three pins to send the voltage to. So here, the evaporator fan motor uh, is running at max speed 14 volts. So when we go to diagnosis, we're looking exactly for 14 volts. And when you look here, you got black, gray, and yellow. So which pins are we testing? There's 14.1, 14.3, and 14.6. FC and RC, what's the difference? Freezer, refrigerator. Freezer compartment, refrigerator compartment. So when you're seeing this FC here and this RC here, they're telling you the fan in the freezer or the fan in the refrigerator. Because if we're diagnosing, we need to know which one. They're both 14 volts. Now, if we went back to the schematic here, on this evaporator fan here, here it is here, one of the evaporator fans. Again, ground, red, blue, VCC. We're going to check which two color wires. For the 14 constant? Mm -hmm. Red and blue. Wait, no. No, red and white. I'm sorry, red and white. Red and white. Red power, white is ground. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay? So that's what we're going to be looking for, 14 volts. We're not even going to bother to check that blue wire going to it. We just want to know when we're in diagnostics if we have 14 volts. If we have 14 volts and that fan's not working, what do we do? We change the fan. If we don't have 14 volts, You're right. if we look at this unit, we follow those wires back. These two wires here, if I follow them back, they go here to P7. They go to this plug here. And then the other one is running off the other side. This red one comes here, goes all the way down. This one right here. And wait, I lost it already. We follow it again one more time. It's coming in across. It's going up and over. 
and going in red right there. P5. P5. It's hard to follow. That's why I recommend when you guys are, are working on schematics and stuff, is get yourself those clear acetate sheets and get dry erase markers. And then you can put them right over top of the diagram and you can trace your circuits without writing over the diagram. And if you mess up, you can erase it. But to follow these circuits out, if you wanted to check the fan motor from the board, and we wanted to check the, the, the two wires on the board, if we go back here, that was red and white here. So red turns to, to red here, but what does it turn to there? Yellow. Yellow. It, no, it turns to black. White turns to black. Oh, black. black, black, black. Yeah. So red and black, where do you, where do you normally see, see DC red and black? On batteries. A car battery, yeah. even even when you plug a 9 volt battery into electronics, yeah. that's usually a little red and a black wire, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Red positive, black negative. Black is ground. So if we follow this black down here, I'm going to go to my drawing tool so I can show you a little bit better here. Um, so if I follow this fan motor here, whoops, I didn't want to do that. If, I know it's a little bit hard for you guys to see, but if I followed that black wire here and came down on the schematic, that black wire is hard to follow. It's actually right here on the board. P14. P14 pin 2? Well, if you look at that upper right hand corner, that copy that I sent you, mm -hmm. and you look for the fan motor, and they tell you P14 pin 1 and P14, that was, uh, oh, yeah. it actually yeah. shows you where it turns from red to black and from what pin to what pin. So they told you the fan motor here, P14 1 is for the freezer and P14 3 is for the fresh food. So if we follow that diagram again, and here I have it zoomed in a little bit more, so let's follow it here. So if I took that black one and followed it into the board here, It's P14-6, which is black. They don't tell you ground here. What do they tell you? That's the constant. So if I wanted to check this evaporator fan, I don't know if that's the freezer or the refrigerator fan. Do you know by the diagram? No. But if we follow the wire back, this red wire, it came over here and came down. I don't know what plug that one to. I have it cut off on the diagram. This red one here, if I follow it down. The red turns to black and the P14 pin 2. P14 pin 2? Yeah. If we're looking at the P. That's this one? If we're looking at the red one. Right, the... Let, me, let me erase it here. <clears throat> so that's P14, right? Red that turns to yellow. It says pin 2 there? Okay. That red one is here. If I follow that red one down, it goes over this way. It comes here. And it goes all the way down. It comes over across here. I think it comes P, here. P3. And ends in pin 14. And uh, ends uh, P14 pin 1. Yeah, 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 pin one. One. yeah, 14 pin 1. Ooh. So what fan is it according to the chart? P14 pin 1 on the chart. It's going to be the evaporator pin one. That's the fresh food. No, P14 uh, pin freezer. one is yeah. this one the here. Freezer. freezer. And that's the freezer pin. Okay, so when we see that it says to and from, to is always the computer board. Where are you seeing to and from? Up, up top it says from color to color. Right under voltage test points Gemini Flash. Okay, so it, it's red from the fan, and then it goes 14 1. So they're talking about here, red from the fan, and then it goes to black. So you're touching this pin and this pin on the board, and that's where you're going to check for voltage. So they're not telling you the location on the fan. Mm. They're telling you on the board, pin 14.1 and 14.2, if we go over here to this diagram, pin 14.1 and 14.2, 1 and 2 on pin 14 is red and black. 
So if you wanted to check the fan motor to, for voltage, mm -hmm. do you have to open a door and pull the whole panel off and go all no. the way down to your evaporator fan motor? No. No, you go right to the main board. You go to plug, plug, plug 14, the first and second pin, which is the red and the black wire, and you're going to check output voltage there. And if you have your voltage there, then the fan's not working, fan's yeah. bad. If you don't have the voltage here, most likely you're bored. Now, if you looked at where I traced the circuit, I know it's a little bit hard to follow. There was no door switch there. Now, the one you were talking about was the Electrolux one, but obviously there's got to be a door switch. But where is the door switch on this unit? Here's the light interlock switch and the light switch, but these switches here, they just connect directly to the board. And the board sees whether the switch is open or closed and then turns the lights on or turns the fan off if it wants the fan to go off. So what about the reed switch? Well, reed switch is just a magnetic switch. Do you know what a reed switch is? Mm -hmm. A reed switch is, let me go over for those who don't know what that is. Let's see, water valve, moisture valve. A reed switch is a switch just like that, but if I put a magnet here, it'll close the switch. When I take the magnet away, the switch opens, or vice versa. You know where you see a lot of those reed switch units? Uh, well, how about GE washing machines? Instead of actually having a, a, a mechanically actuated switch, they have a little uh, plastic switch underneath the, the top, and the lid itself has a magnet in it, and when they close the door, the magnet activates the switch. Mm -hmm. And those homes, the older alarm systems in your homes, you'd have a little a rectangular magnet on the window, and you have another little box with wires on it. When they open the window, the magnet goes away from the switch. That's how the alarm knows the door was open. When they close the door, the magnet lines up with the switch, and then the door, door activates. Okay? So that's just the fan motor. Let's take a look at the condenser fan motor. I'll zoom in on that in a second. Let me just clear this up. How much voltage goes to our condenser fan motor? Let me go back to the schematic here. How much voltage goes to our condenser fan motor? 120. 120? Why do you say that, Joe? You are correct, mm -hmm. but why do you say it? I guess that's where the power will come in there. Yeah, but the, this fan motor was only 14 volts DC. You're right that it's 120, but Ooh. what makes you know that it's 120? How would you know by looking at this condenser fan motor that it runs off 120 and not... We can look at the chart, right? We have this chart here. I don't see anything here, condenser fan motor. There's a condenser fan right there. What does it say? Uh, 120, you guys see? 120. 120 yeah. But you don't need that because look right here. You see this fan motor? Is this a little icon? No, no. You see the fan motor? Oh, that's the inverter. If I follow this line here, what is this? Oh, no, 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 no. Neutral. Neutral? This line is neutral. Hmm. If the component goes to line, or neutral directly, like this one here, directly goes to the power cord, it's 120 volts. If it's connected directly to the control board, it could still be 120, but most likely it's low voltage because it's coming off the board. Yes, sir. So in this situation, if you slide down, that condenser fan feeds from a power supply all the way at the bottom. No, it still comes off the board. It's just probably a relay on the board. If I follow this red wire here from the fan motor and come down, it's right here on P1, pin 4. P1? Yeah, well, look at your chart. Look, you go right here. P1, 4, and P1, 2, white. So, um, yeah, it connects off the board, but only one side of the fan is going to the board, and the board's passing 120 through. It's probably got a relay. Okay. So that power goes into the board, a mechanical relay will close and send power to that condenser fan motor. Ooh, that's an engineering question, okay. Go ahead, ask. I was going to say, why feed a board 120 when you have a perfectly viable power supply at the bottom of the fridge? If you scroll down, you'll see it, and then you could just actuate the relay over there. 
wine mix and match on the same board. But this so power it, supply is not producing 120. This power supply is lowering the voltage oh, so that okay. the board. So this is a power supply that's giving us our 5 volts, our 7 volts, and our 14 volts that we identified at the beginning. So the main board is not converting the voltage. The main board is just controlling where it goes, okay. what goes on and off. But the power supply board, which on some appliances, power supply board is part of the main board. The manufacturer here decided to put separate power supply board, and these are probably output voltages that feed the user interface board and the Gemini flash board. If we find the power supply board here, um, See if you find the power supply. Power board. supply is going to be J1, J2 plug. Well, here's J1 and J2 right here. But this has the stealth board. Let me see something. It those lines feed to the stealth board. So well, we J1 need to test and J2. Board. Okay, so that's not this J1. But this here has got J J1 is input voltage, which would be line voltage. So 120. And then you see black coming in here and white going out, and it's black and white again. And then this one here is low voltage outputs that go to the other board, which is controlling it. So the user interface, the UI is the user interface. That's the one that when the customer's calling for ice and they put their cup or anything like that, it's activated there. The ice bucket, the ice door stepper motor, all those things are controlled by that control board. We got um, the main board here, the Gemini board, and then we have this valve. We're not going to talk about that yet, but. And one last thing, on the power supply, it just says thermal fuse on the bottom right corner. Where would that fuse be? Is it just shoved in there? The, the thermal fuse would be on the board. It'd probably be soldered onto the so board. So not serviceable. No, you'd have to change the board if there was a power surge like lightning or, or a surge where something shorted in the board and fed back. Mm. that that fuse would open up to prevent the power supply okay. from burning up or something like that. Okay. Because we are converting 120 down to DC volts. Okay? So, um, the Gemini board is the brake. It's the one that's controlling everything. Let's take a look here at our compressor. Our compressor has two plugs on it. First, let's take a look at the plug on the right. How much voltage is on that plug on the right? Is it 120? Very good, Joe. You're on a roll today, sir. And if we look here, let me just expand a little bit more so we can see it. If we look here, the one plug on the right, one wire here goes to neutral and out. And the other wire goes to black and out. When would we have 120 volts at that plug? When the compressor is running? No, you'll always get it. It's just that you'll be receiving um, a secondary signal from the control board itself to start the compressor. Okay, well, so what does that mean? Well, that means that the comp control board is going to be what turns on that compressor. So are you talking about the Gemini board? Yes, I'm talking okay, about the Gemini board. Okay, that's just a name that Whirlpool uses. So this plug here has a constant 120 volts always, even when the compressor is not running. We have two plugs going to that, that compressor. So we got a compressor, and then the compressor has an inverter board attached to it. Like the Electrolux, the ones you guys worked on the other day. Mm -hmm. There's a great plug on there. What's your question, uh, Amelia? Oh, no, that's an AC motor, correct? No, the inverter. No, no, that's, above the AC. that's an inverter that converts it. That inverter converts the voltage. So it's AC input into the inverter, and then the inverter converts it. Oh, that's right. Inverter mm -hmm. converts it to DC. What does an inverter do? Yeah, okay, it inverts. Yeah. It inverts, so it changes it from what? AC, AC to DC. DC. So it's an inverter. So we have 120 supply always at that board. But it's this one here, which is the communication plug. If we follow that plug down, and I'll go to the other diagram just to 
make it easier to see. If we follow the bottom plug down, and I'll have to I'll move it around. If we follow these two wires down, they come down here, and they run here. Here's one of the wires. That wire comes into P8. All right? So on P8, you got 7, 1, 8, and 2. So if we run back to our legend here, P8, 5 volt DC input for RC evaporator thermistor. So pins 1 and 2 are for the evaporator thermistor, but 7 and 8 says what? 7.5 volts when the compressor is on. And what two pins is that? Seven and eight. So if we looked at this board here, we looked at this board here, the red and the black, seven and eight here, are 7.5 volts. So if we go to the compressor that has the inverter on it, let me go to the other diagram so I can draw it. We got the compressor inverter on it, right here at these two points, you're looking for 7.5 volts. DC. If you're there, ask, ask me, because then if you're talking, then, no. then I'm talking over you. So I'd rather you communicate to me and not to him. I'd have to kick him out for interrupting my class. It was because I saw at the top it just said test terminal, and I was following it to see what was going on. Actually, I'm going to explain what that is when I get into it. It's in the deep rust. But let's, oh, okay. So let's talk about this. So let's say you go to this refrigerator, and the fans are working. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That the fans are working. What does the that compressor mean? Compressor is working. Compressor should be working, and we're also in the cooling cycle. Yeah. Because yeah. once temperature is set, fans and compressor will shut off. When it calls for cooling, they all come up. So you want to know if the compressor is supposed to be running. You go over there, you touch the compressor, and compressor is not working. First thing we want to do is we want to check on this pin and this pin for 120 volts. AC. Because that's black and white, line one and neutral coming into the compressor. Then, if we go here according to our test points, the other two wires should be 7.5 volts DC. Now, if we look at the chart, it's here again. We'll go back to this chart. Pin 7 and 8, 7.5 volts when the compressor is on. So that's the plug going to the compressor. So if we get 7.5 volts at the inverter and 120 volts at the inverter, that rules out what? No, it rules out that the, the Gemini, well, the, the main boards, the thermistors aren't bad. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that because the board is telling the other board, the main board is telling the inverter board to do its job. turn the compressor on. So if I have the 7.5 and a 120 and my compressor is not working, what else could we do? The inverter board would be the issue there. Uh, the well, compressor is not bad. Oh, you gave me to it. I was going to say after you test to make sure the compressor is still good. Well, how would you test the compressor to see if the compressor is good? Continuity. Continuity. Check the grounding. And so, then if we look at the compressor, we got how many pins? Three. I was going to ask that. It's got three. And they're all the same resistance. Uh -huh. So in this case, that's just for just like the, the sake just of like it. the washer motor we were working on the other day. So for the sake of it, let's just say it's seven point five, seven point five, seven point five. But we only have two wires feeding it. So how are we getting it to start with only two wires? I don't know if that's really two wires if it's showing three there. Because, but it does look fishy. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's it's the drawing. It's probably a plug. Yeah. Okay. Uh, LG, though, the linear compressor, it has three pins. But when you look at the plug, there's only two wires, which only touch two, because they only have one winding because it's like a solenoid. It just pulls the piston. Okay. And so, if, you're, if you're curious to see that, that refrigerator right there is the one that, that has that plug. Okay, so in this situation, we're looking at it like this because it's on a diagram, but in reality, that would be that little inverter board stuck to the side of that compressor. Yes. Yeah. So and that means the, twin side. Now, if we went to this compressor here, notice it's the same, the same thing, the same drawing. Okay. It's the way the manufacturer drew it. Okay, another question I have. How come all the grounds don't meet somewhere? Or the earth wire, I guess, in this case. I've noticed in some machines, 
they start to come from all over the place and eventually meet at one bolt. But then on other machines, they just well, start running all over the place. We don't use ground as... Or chassis return. We don't use a chassis ground. We have individual ground wires returning back to the board. So how do you stop from Because remember, the appliance is 120 right? volts. Now, the actual chassis ground is for all of our 120 volt components. They're going to have a ground wire to chassis as a safety. The other ones are low voltage components. So the low voltage components are not going to do anything okay. if they short out or whatever. They're just going to feed back to the board and damage the board. To um, save itself from the fire. Yeah, and you can see it, there's a, like a ground here, but this low voltage here, which is power and ground, red and black, then, you know, it's only going to have 120 volts. I'm sorry, not 120, it's going to have the, the 7.5 volts going into that point. Okay. Okay, so if, the, if we have the two voltages here and the ohms check good, doesn't mean the compressor can still be bad, right? What could be wrong with the compressor? Remember, it's, most of them are piston operated yeah. mechanically. You can have a mechanical failure. Yeah. It doesn't happen that often. But if the compressor's not running, what I tell guys to do, order the compressor with the inverter board. Try the inverter board on the compressor. As long as the windings aren't shorted, change the inverter board first because you can just unplug it, throw it on, customer's compressor runs, you're done. But you, you change the inverter real quick and a compressor don't run, well, now you gotta do a sealed system job, change the compressor. Yeah, you turn the a mystery situation to just A, B. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you change the inverter first, and you know, if that don't fix it, you change the inverter with the compressor and change the two of them together. It's typically that, like, if the compressor is bad, you also change out the com converter board as well. Like, that's standard. It, it's, it, well. it, a lot of manufacturers, when you buy the compressor, the inverter's in the box with that it anyways. So oh. So you'd be able to like, not that you would always, but if it ended up being the compressor, you'd get to get not a free inverter, but an inverter that might work in another situation where. Oh yeah, yeah, you could keep. You might even end up with a test that, inverter. Keep that as a trust stop. You know. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, That's cool. I've been running a couple of. Let's take a that. let's take a look at this test uh, point. I was going to get to that, but now that you brought it up, let's take a look at this test point. Whirlpool is one of the only manufacturers that use this test terminal here. Uh, test terminal up in the control panel, even this goes back, I don't know, 60s and 70s they started doing this. You go work on a refrigerator that was mechanical, that had a regular thermostat and timer, no control board or nothing. They had this plug in the controls where the timer and the thermostat was. You drop it down and you saw this plug that had a, a pink and a tan wire on it. Uh, they call it brown now, but it's usually tan. And it, they had a pink and a tan wire on it, and the plug's just laying in there, and you're looking inside the fridge, and you're like, where does this go? Oh. <laughs> and you always wonder what the plug was for, but it was never connected to anything. Well, that is a test terminal. So when you go into defrost, normally if the thermostat was open, you couldn't see if the heater was working or not. So when you go a mechanic advance a timer, we could jump it out here, and that would be where the controls are with a jumper, and that would apply voltage. Now, this computer, because it's, uh, I'm sorry, this refrigerator, because it's computer controlled, you have a lot more options. First of all, if we look at it, we follow this pink and brown wire down, they come down to a plug here. It can bypass that bimetal and send power directly to the heater. Oh, now, if you look, 56,000 ohms optional. Maytag started doing this back in the 90s. They had a, a heater with a defrost thermostat. That thermostat is a safety device. We go into defrost, the heater comes on, runs, the cycle usually runs 20 to 22 minutes. But the heater may have got that area back there in the 50s, and we don't want to get too hot because that's right behind where all the food is stored in the same compartment. So we don't apply too much heat, we just want to melt the ice off the tubing and get the tubing ready to go again for more cooling. So the thermostat is supposed to open, let's say it took 10 minutes to get that area hot enough, thermostat's supposed to open and stop the heater from working as a safety device so we don't melt all the customer's food. So what Maytag did is they put 
a resistor inside the bimetal. So if the bimetal contacts were open and you were ohming the bimetal out, you would get 56,000 ohms. Now, not most of them do that, but you can make the test on the thermostat. But if you went to a customer's refrigerator and it's packed with ice, it's going to take you 20 minutes to melt the ice to get the panel off to test it. And then you added all this heat to get the ice out. Well, you warmed up the thermostat and it opened up anyways. So what happened is the test terminal allowed you to ohm it out right here, or you could file these two wires back to the board. And if I got zero ohms on that test terminal, I knew the thermostat was closed. So and my heater didn't work, I could test my heater too. We'll get to that in one second. Or if I got 56,000 ohms and I know the back of it's packed in ice, then I know the bimetal's back. Bimetal's open. So that test terminal runs triple duty. That one does another test. I'll tell you another one. So you one. don't have to melt the metal, melt the ice at all. Not, no, because you can test it from the test terminal. You, but what if I wanted to check the defrost heater? Well, you know, one side of the heater is this brown terminal, oh, so brown and the other side goes to neutral on the plug, or I could find a neutral that goes back to my board somewhere, and I could check from brown to white somewhere on the board, and I can ohm out the defrost heater. So I can check the defrost heater from this test terminal. I can check the bimetal from the test terminal. Not only that, but if I put my meter on brown or pink and use ground or neutral somewhere, I can check voltage and see if the board is sending power. Mm -hmm. If I want to know if the board's sending power to the pink wire, I put one meter lead on pink here, and I put the other meter lead on a neutral anywhere in the machine. If I have 120, what does that tell me? My board is sending power. If I move it to the brown one and I don't have 120, what does that mean? My metal's open. So I put one on pink and one on neutral somewhere in the fridge, go into force defrost, and it has the instructions there how to do it. So I'll, I'll show you where that is. You force defrost, you got voltage here, pink and white. You know the board is telling it to defrost. You go brown to white, and you still have voltage. What does that mean? My metal's closed. Now I got a defrost heater. My heater ain't working. I can ohm it out, see if it's open, or I can check voltage, brown and white. If I have voltage there and that thing's packed in ice, most thing is my heater's back. And most heaters are cowl rod heaters. They're, they're like the, the metal coil like on top of your stove or in your oven. So they don't go bad that often, except for GE. GE side-by-sides and some of their top mounts, the old ones, they use what they call a glass tube heater. The heater's in a glass tube, and you can see the ends burn in the glass tube. Moisture gets in there and shorts out the elements. They go bad a lot. They have two elements in series. Um, those are old school. Uh, they yeah. change it now to a double on the bottom instead of two, halfway in a, on the heater and everything. But... Whirlpool put that test terminal in, and Whirlpool's the only one that really did something like that, but it, it saved you from having to go into the freezer to make those tests. So there's more than triple duty, because I jump it out, I can go to the heater, I can test the bimetal, I can check the heater, I can check voltage, I can do a bunch of things from that test terminal, all for my defrost cycle. Okay, so... You can see here all these LED lights. That, that has a driver. What does that mean? Power, right? So if, if we wanted to check voltage, we could go to the board here where the, here's the LED driver, and it tells you 115 going in and 14 coming out. So this driver, two of those wires are 115 volts coming in. The rest of them are 14 volts coming out. If the lights aren't working, you know you got 14 volts coming out. It's not the board, it's something with one of those lights. And remember I said, if one of those lights fail, they all don't work. And here it looks like a simple LED diode kind of light, but usually they have like little circuit boards. They're not just a simple LED light. Yes? So I gotta ask you. Because I see that there's about three series of, of lights. Three sets of series, yes. Exactly, three, three, three sets of series. 
And again, if one of them just goes bad, say for example, the one on the bottom. That's this where, one here. Yeah, that one right there. That'll just straight up affect all the other ones from the top, right? No. Because it looks no, like no. These will work and this one won't. Those will work. Okay. Okay. So they're like, they're all not in series with each other. Oh. Just these four are in series with one circuit from yellow to yellow and red. Okay. These three are in series from white red to red, and this one here is uh, white and red to tan and red. Okay. Because I mean, it, so. That means that that driver in this situation does double duty. Number one, it doesn't let so that the blowout of one light stops every circuit from working in that light quote unquote array. It only it only it only does it only that circuit. It's specific chain, and on top of that, that tells me that this fridge probably has slow on slow off lights. Not is, always, but not know, always. Like they, they, you'll yeah, find. They do. That's You'll find nice. some of those lights that do what they call ramp up, where like they're dim and they get brighter and then and then they get darker. That's usually on the more higher end units. That is true. So if if they would just come on from zero to one hundred on full blast apart, opening of a door switch, you wouldn't need a driver, would you? You wouldn't need a driver. That would be redundant. You would just need a board to because to, to drop on, the voltage. Not a, well, that's the thing. That you could have just been run, run off the of because I've seen that on some okay. fridges. So now let me ask you a question. Here's the lights, here's the driver board, but what tells it to turn the lights on and off? The Gemini board. Which okay, is... but what tells the Gemini board to turn the lights on and off? Door switch. Door switch. So we have a light switch here, right? Mm -hmm. And a light interlock switch. So this light switch here, if you follow this wire, it goes to a, a so common terminal. Mm -hmm. And watch, one of them, look, Goes into your board. One of them goes into your board. That's your 120 volt input between the red and yellow and the white. Now let me ask you a question. Wow, that door switch is game over. Okay, so so let's take a look at this for a second now. Uh, let me erase this mess here. I know it's a little blurry, but this is just for following circuits. If we're looking at at this board here. I move it up just a little bit. Power comes in this light switch and then goes here and directly feeds power here. And this is neutral. So these two pins are 120 volts AC. Right? Because white is neutral. I can follow that back and it's gonna it's gonna get me a neutral somewhere. Wait, that white looks like it dies on P3. Yes, it does die on P3, but then P3 it gets it uses the bo the Gemini board just for its neutral. But that's not what's telling it to come on and off. This one here, when I apply voltage here, that board is energized. So let me ask you a question. That presents a different theory, uh huh? No. Does just one strand come on, or do all of them come on even if the, that that section of the door is not open? There's no other separate control circuit. There's, there's no way for it to know. It would only know if, if I got 120 here, it energizes all three. <coughs> if this set, this set, and this set. So we have one set here, another set here, and another set of lights here. But if I apply 120 here, all oh, three of those sets right. come on. Freezers and refrigerator, all the lights come on. Yeah. Even if the door's not open. So if you had no lights at all, you could have bad lights in one section. I've had customers sometimes that one light goes bad and they never call. And then another one goes bad in a different circuit. So you go and now they have no lights. So now they call for help. And you're like, what's the odds of all those lights being bad? It's got to be a bad board, right? Or door switch. So you go over here and you check for 120. I got 120. Okay, ma'am, I'm going to order you the driver board. So I present you with one. No, let, let, let me finish with, with the thing. So I got 120, we say, okay, we order this because none of the lights are working. Well, all we have to do to identify if our driver board is good or bad, check 120 in and then just pick one circuit and see if we got the, the voltage coming out to the lights. If we have the voltage coming out, then our lights are our problem. And if all of them don't work, the lights are our problem. Which one of those in this circuit are bad, we don't know. And it's hard, you can't really hone them out too well to say, oh, this is good or bad. But you could shove the circuit. If I got voltage, problems the light itself. If I don't have output voltage, the driver board's bad and we order the board. 
Now, what was your question or statement? From the way it looks like it's designed, and that ground dying inside the germ of uh, the Gemini, technically speaking, if that light switch got stuck in the open position, the Gemini could count how long that circuit's been alive, kill it so that the LED board doesn't overheat, neither will the LEDs. They usually do that. Because like, if you leave like the doors if, open if, accidentally, if you do that, it'll if, overheat. If you do that refrigerator and leave the door open, you come back 10 minutes later, the lights are off. Because they have no way to cool themselves. You're correct. But not but not only that, but the added heat from the light will do what to the food? Speed up the spoiler. Yeah. You'll be surprised that one <coughs> bowl not shutting off in a refrigerator will destroy could apply enough heat to cause food to spoil. And actually even straight up crack the lining. I've seen lining straight up. Wood. I've seen them get burnt or, or they, 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 a lot of them yeah. use that foil tape, extra thick foil tape on the plastic where the light bulb is, because if the light stayed on, I had one refrigerator back in the day, I was teaching in the other building, I had a side-by-side -side Amana, and the refrigerator was never getting to temperature. But you open the door and you push the light, the light switch went on and off. But what happened is, on the refrigerator, especially side-by-side, -side, if it's not sitting level on the ground, and part of the floor is higher or lower than the other, you turn doors do this. And what was happening is the door was closing and it was hitting the light switch, but it was only pushing it that much. So you open a door and you hit the light switch and it goes off. But you close the door and it doesn't push the switch far enough to open the contact. And it, it was just the alignment of the refrigerator as it sits on the floor. Before you adjust the hinges on these doors, you make sure your refrigerator's level so that the doors can level out on the refrigerator. Do they have adjustable feet like dryers or washers? Yes. Yeah. The, the wheels Almost. might have a screw and you can push one wheel down or raise one wheel up. The real high-end ones, even the back wheels, they have a real long screw that runs all the way to the back and allows you to adjust all four points on the bottom of the refrigerator. Those units in, in the kitchen there have a four-point alignment. <laughs> so um, that's pretty much some of the things I want to cover. Here's evaporator motor. Notice they put what? RC there. The other one didn't have it. You know, so this one says evaporator fan motor RC. Well, this one just said evaporator fan motor. So RC meant what? That's the one in the refrigerator part. Now, the one final thing I want to talk about before we end is the solenoid valve here. That is a three-way valve. Yes, sir. Um, one question before we go there. Uh -huh. um, if you scroll up to the ice maker, why do I have a switch after a switch? What sense does that make? Well, that is a switch that is a manual switch that the customer can turn it on and off. That is the bucket switch. If they take the ice bucket out of the refrigerator, the ice maker will not drop ice. Okay. So, so, so customers when they want to go on vacation, they just hit a switch and leave the bucket in the refrigerator filled with ice, and now I go on vacation for a couple of days, my ice maker don't make ice while I'm gone. But then that means that ice the ice maker box itself has a switch, another switch on top of that. Wouldn't that switch just be put in the open position? Or the ice maker make ice up until its max position? No, this switch here is probably the ice limit switch no 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 that switch is when when ice makers drop ice they usually have an arm that raises or an arm that comes out ice falls down the arm goes back in the position so now when a bucket fills up with ice to prevent ice overflowing into the freezer once it gets to a certain level the ice maker as it cycles the arm will raise up ice will fall down and then it'll go down if the ice is too high that arm will keep it from making any more ice until the ice drops in the bin. So in my freezer, to turn it off, you push that past its limit position. And, and you the... raise it up, and that, that would be that switch. Yeah. So now we have three switches going almost. Yeah, but this one here is not one that the customer can adjust. It's for the oh, so it would be... It, it's built is... into the ice maker itself. You can't physically read Because it. on Whirlpool, some of them, this one says sensor, that's a thermistor telling it to drop ice. It's probably a flex tray ice maker which is a plastic tray ice maker that rotates and then it flexes the tray just like the old school when you made ice and you did this with your hand and the ice fell out. Yeah. So this might be a flex tray ice maker. So the thermistor tells it when to drop the ice. The fan is the one that's 
circulating the ice, or that, that might be the, the, the motor to twist and flex the tray, that switch is the overfill switch. Okay. Now, in some whirlpools, they have the ice bucket on the door. Now they have an, an LED and a mineral receiver, and they shoot an infrared light through the bucket, and when the bucket ice falls, it blocks that infrared that knows not to produce no more ice. And they don't have a mechanical switch like that. It's a board. So this switch is when the ice bucket's too high. This switch is as if the ice bucket has been removed. You have a party, you take the ice bucket out. Hey, you need ice, and you're putting ice in people's glasses and everything. It. You forget to put it back. The ice bucket won't drop ice onto the, onto the freezer. And then this one here is a manual shut. So like if you're going to have like a water line or something that just permanently disabled it. Yeah. Now, right here, this is a solenoid valve. That is your three-way valve. And if we look at this refrigerator that I have here, I have the parts breakdown. This actually has two separate evaporators, refrigerator side and freezer side. And so this unit here, because we were talking about temperature controls and everything, depending on demand, we can turn one on or the other one on. I don't know if this one will turn both on simultaneously, but depending on the cooling load, we can turn the evaporator on in just one side of the refrigerator and cool that compartment down to a specific set point. And then we go to the other evaporator and turn it on. So that means this refrigerator doesn't have what? We started off talking about it at the beginning. It wouldn't have a damper. It wouldn't have a baffle, a damper. Because it could just... Wait, but then couldn't you just kill the fan going to that one and that's it? It'll get a little cold, but it's not going to ice over. Yeah, but ice ice will build up on the evaporator. Oh, over time? Yeah. yeah. So it will defrost it and everything, but... That's quite an expensive solution, but... Okay. No, but now we're more accurate with the temperature on each side of the compartment. So we can get away with it, okay. And if a customer stands or open the refrigerator door, we run just the refrigerator side to cool it down. We're not running the freezer side. We'll freeze. reach set temp faster, less electricity. We're going to save electricity. So. A lot of these designs, one, are for more accurate temperatures, but they're also to be more energy conservative. Mm -hmm. And by only cooling one compartment, we're cooling half the, half the space in the other. So if we run into a fridge that has a three-way valve, it is totally possible for the fridge to be ambient temperature and the freezer to be just cold as a bone? Not really. Because that I'm first startup. But if you go into someone's house... You don't see the three of got stuck feeding only the freezer. Well, that happened to the refrigerator in my office. I had a French door refrigerator. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I got a video on, on TMN that we talked about it. I had two guys troubleshooting the refrigerator. And the, the refrigerator section got so cold that the water filter and reservoir kept freezing and cracking and breaking. Not only that, if I put a drink in there, by the end of the night, my drink was frozen. So I told the guys, hey man, and they said, thermistors, it's a Samsung, thermistors go bad all the time. I said, okay, I'll let you guys troubleshoot it. I didn't, I didn't get involved. So they went ahead and I got every thermistor. They changed every thermistor in the refrigerator. Still froze everything in the refrigerator. I said, okay, well, what else? Well, maybe the main board is seeing the temperature right, but it's not shutting off like it's supposed to. I'll get you a main board. Put a main board in there. Still did the same thing. So I asked the guys, I said, did you check to see if the three-way valve, and the three-way valve, let me see where it is. It should be on, in this picture here somewhere. It's, it's, it's right there on the compressor, by the compressor, I believe, right? 13? Yeah, 13. Okay, right here, yeah. That's, that's the three-way valve right here. Okay, so that's the solenoid, that's the actual valve down below. Okay, so, I told the guys, I said, let me ask you a question. On all this testing that you did, did you check to see if when the refrigerator got to set temperature, 40 degrees, 36 degrees, that it told the step valve, stop sending free on up to the evaporator? The fan motor was shutting off, but the evaporator kept running. And not only that, but the evaporator started building up with ice. Remember, Carl, you defrosted that refrigerator because it was packed with ice back there? The evaporator was packed with ice. They thought it was not defrosting. I said, but if it was packed with ice and not defrosting, that extra ice buildup would actually affect your cooling temperatures and you wouldn't be that cold.
But when it was all frosted with ice, the refrigerator worked like it was normal because the air wasn't flowing over the evaporator, the air was flowing over the ice. So going to that refrigerator a little bit more, I said, did you guys check the step valve? Because in diagnostics, you can tell the valve to send free onto this evaporator or that evaporator. Did you check to see if the valve mechanically or electrically was telling each evaporator to come on and off? And they said, no, we didn't do it. I said, okay, I'll order you, I'll order you a step valve. You know, they, they did doing the diagnostics and see that the refrigerator evaporator never shut off. So I said, okay, I'll go ahead and get you order a step valve. The next day I came in and I asked the guys, did you get me the part number of a step valve? They said, you know what, Z? I want to look at something. They pulled the refrigerator out. The valve wasn't plugged in. Wouldn't diagnostics immediately warn you is that wrong? No, diagnostics doesn't know whether the valve is plugged in or not. It just sends a voltage and then the valve shifts to where it tells it to. It's like a water valve on a washing machine. Yeah. I put water valve to the solenoid. I can have it disconnected. It doesn't know if the solenoid's connected. The board is not watching air bridge flow to see if it's actually drawing amperage. Oh, it just checks another sensor. It just applies, job got it just sends voltage, mm -hmm. and it's got sensors over there. Keep saying, hey, the refrigerator ain't cold enough, so it's yeah. still running. Yeah, okay. And then yeah. it said the refrigerator reached temp, send power to the freezer, but it was telling the solenoid to send power to the freezer, but the solenoid wasn't sending power to the freezer. Okay, and the solenoid is like a T-shaped two solenoids, or it's a single solenoid? It's a single solenoid with So free up uh, can go up or down? They can't go both? You can take a look at the back of that refrigerator and you'll see. Okay. Um, so, to make a long story short, then I checked it back, the plug wasn't on. So what happened was, that refrigerator, I'll, I'll just make it real quick, that refrigerator was a customer that we went out to troubleshoot, and the customer put the wrong gas in it. It was 600A on the fridge, and they put 134A. So, I said, they gave us the refrigerator. So I said, I'm gonna bring it and use it as a class to teach the guys how to change a 600A compressor. So I brought it in and had all my techs come in and we changed the compressor here in class and taught them how to charge it and evacuate it, you know, do the whole system. They unplugged the three-way valve and never plugged it back at that time. Mm -hmm. I didn't use the refrigerator right away. It sat out in the shop for a month or two I said, you know what, guys, that's a nice refrigerator. It's got the, the hub, the, the family tablet on there. Let's put that one in my office and use that one as my office refrigerator. People can still use it for testing, but let's leave that one in there. So sure enough, that's the whole thing they didn't plug in the step valve, and that was the problem the whole time. So in other words, a lot of people go into sealed system jobs without checking that everything is mechanically or electrically doing what it's supposed to do before you put valves on and start testing the system. Mm -hmm. Any questions, guys? No? That's it. You can stop it.